Welcome back to our anesthesia exam preparation course and a new hot topic that's commonly found in the exams. And this topic is peripartum hemorrhage. Why it's commonly found in the exams? Because it's one of the leading causes of maternal mortality. Our idiom today will be focus on the boy. What does this mean? It means each case scenario usually have two or three pathologies that's your ball always focus on the three pathologies don't be deceived and go to one pathology and forget the other two that's the trick i trust you are going to have a benefit in today's scenario our clinical case is a 32 year old gravid 2 para 1 and a portion is 0 she's a 35 plus 2 days pregnancy and she presented with a painless bleeding she is known case of rheumatic heart disease and she is mentioning something about systolic murmur which she is not sure about what it is and surgeon is asking you to go for a category 2 lower segment caesarean section now that's a category 2 we'll discuss the scenario in this way and then I'll ask another question if this patient has a minimal bleeding but she's coming for an elective caesarean section and she presented in the clinic how the management is going to differ So questions and objectives from this scenario will be number one, what's the difference between painless and painful bleeds? What's the cause of this lady's bleed because it's painless bleeding? Causes of peripartum hemorrhage and presentation and how to diagnose that? What the investigations required and what's the management? What's the definition of major obstetric hemorrhage? How you are going to give anesthesia for this lady and then we'll jump to the murmurs on the heart. What are the different murmurs on the heart? What's in the apex? What is systolic? What is diastolic? And then proceed from this point. How you describe a murmur? All these will be discussed in today's video. So let's go to the first question. What's painless and painful bleeding? Simply, painless bleeding is placenta previa, while painful bleeding is an abruptio placenta. And both of those scenarios needs to be admitted in the hospital for multiple reasons. It's a concealed bleeding. It's very difficult to assess either by the mother or by the physicians. So you should keep an eye on this patient and she should be hospitalized. Okay, second question will be, what are the causes of peripartum bleed and how you're going to manage it? So definition of antipartum hemorrhage so we classify peripartum bleeds into antipartum and postpartum antipartum is a bleeding from 24 weeks of gestation so what's before that it's a miscarriage and they classify that into early miscarriage and late miscarriage so anything after 14 week and up to 24 weeks that's a late miscarriage anything before 14 weeks it's an early miscarriage so anything comes after 24 weeks of gestation till labor is an antipartum hemorrhage so you should be familiar with the terms what are the causes again placenta previa and abruptio placenta makes the major part of that and the major is really is in the placenta previa it's an 80 percent so placenta previa is an 80% of antipartum hemorrhage causes. You try and rupture and always remember domestic violence and trauma. Complications is maternal and fetal. The maternal complications is shock, preterm labor, and fetal is hypoxia and death. What's the postpartum hemorrhage? Postpartum hemorrhage is again primary, which happens in the first 24 hours, and secondary, which happens after 24 hours and up to 6 weeks. 
there is a mnemonic for uh, postpartum hemorrhage which is four T's these four T's are tone over distension of the uterus decreases the tone for example polyhydramnios another example is multi gestation third one is twin pregnancy macrosomia and other causes of uterine over distension to colitics and general anesthesia itself causes uterine atony tissue that means retained products of placenta trauma to the uterus and finally thrombin which means all coagulation factor deficiencies either congenital or acquired how you are going to diagnose a patient with peripartum bleeding will you take the physiological parameters in the non-pregnant lady and use it here yes but please be vigilant tachycardia for example is a very late sign it happens sometimes when the lady loses 40 percent up to 40 percent of her blood then tachycardia starts to come and also if this happens if bleeding happens intra partum while you are doing a cesarean section you the lady lost 1.5 or 2 liters and you have given this lady a regional anesthesia like spinal uh, or epidural and you are running phenylephrine infusion that would be a very very late sign and even may not happen at all because phenylephrine causes a reflex bradycardia as you know tachypnea hypotension also another late sign pallor and poor urine output as we always use as a parameter for tissue perfusion and finally you are treating two patients you may use the CTG if there is fetal distress will be apparent always be vigilant always think peripartum bleeding assess for that I trust your examiner will be more than happy if you mention something about the news score which is a national early warning score so it's a cumulative score with a physiological parameter that gives you an idea how critical your patient is and there is a obstetric version for the score so obstetric national early warning score going to the next point is how you are going to treat this lady with a peripartum bleed how you're going to manage so management is diagnosis and treatment and in such critical situation you have to do it simultaneously so diagnosis you will send her labs her important labs immediately after inserting the IV line so again how to manage this lady be organized be systematic don't lose marks so I'll say there is general measures and specific measures the general measures resuscitating any shocked patient put oxygen 100% oxygen two big IV lines delegate the rules if you can get an invasive monitoring from with a colleague put an arterial line she's a pregnant lady don't forget the position put her on the left lateral position and all the fluids you are using here should be warm IV fluids put a central line or not it depends on how many hands are helping you in this scenario always there is two units of O negative blood use it if you need it and activate major obstetric hemorrhage code which contains the blood bank the hematologist senior anesthetist senior obstetrician and pediatrician always focus on the vicious circle of hypothermia acidosis hyperkalemia coagulopathy cell salvage is a very good option but after suction of the amniotic fluid and use a leukocyte depletion filter definitive treatment or specific treatment is identification of the cause of bleeding medical treatment for the hemorrhage with uterotonic and hematological drugs 
and radiological intervention, surgical intervention. That's the definitive management. What other drugs we use to control the bleeding? As we said, uterine atony is one of the most common causes, so use uterotonics. What are the uterotonics? Oxytocin or syntocinone. Inject five units. Please don't forget that your patient is shocked. That will be very slow and use vasopressors simultaneously. She's a hemodynamically unstable patient. Ergometrin that causes the incidence of nausea and vomiting and precipitates a myocardial ischemia and myocardial infarction sometimes. So it, it's used in 500 micrograms. Please use it intramuscular rather than intravenously. It's contraindicated for direct IV use. Misoprostol, that's an E1 analog and that can be usefully in combination with other drugs and the, the good advantage with this drug it can be used orally, rectally and sublingually. Prostaglandin F2 alpha, F2 alpha or carboprost that's 0.25 mg per dose up to 8 doses which is 2 mg. Again this is another precipitant of hypertension pulmonary hypertension and bronchospasm, avoid in asthmatic patient or try to avoid it in asthmatic patient. Use it very cautiously. Then hematological drugs like tranexamic acid with multiple research recently done recommending use of tranexamic acid. There's a woman trial, you should be aware of that trial. It's a recent trial, multi-center, multi-country study at the end, they recommend use of tranexamic acid. Recombinant factor 7A. Factor 7A or Novo7, it's another drug that helps coagulation or a procoagulant that helps stop of maternal bleeding. Radiological, how you're gonna deal with this patient, it's interventional radiology. It can be done on emergency basis if the mother is hemodynamically stable enough to go to the radiology suite or if you know in advance like our case scenario in the beginning we said she may present in the clinic surgical there's a lot of sur surgical interventions that can stop bleeding but simply performed by manual uterine compression bilinch sutures surgical ligation of ovarian artery uterine artery internal iliac artery and partial or total hysterectomies so, what is the definition of major obstetric hemorrhage? There is no consensus definition on the amount of blood that categorizes the patient as a major obstetric bleed. Usually, 1000 ml is not a big loss and is of little significance. Suggested criteria is more than 1.5 liters, hemoglobin drop more than 4 grams, and if you need to transfuse this lady more than four units of red cells. Definition, depending on the hemodynamic compromise, is of no use. Because pregnant lady physiology is totally different from non-pregnant. How we are going to anesthetize this patient? I need you to know that there is no regional anesthesia recommended for this patient. You cannot give her regional anesthesia because of four main reasons. This is a bleeding patient, so there's a hemodynamic compromise expected. She's coagulopathic with a risk of, with a risk of hematoma and cord compression. Unexpected duration, she may take hours and you need to shift again to general anesthesia. And here comes the trick. You forgot that this patient has a murmur focus on the ball that's a nice trick you see this is category 2 cesarean section she is coming with bleeding and you should mention that you don't know what is the systolic murmur in this lady and what's its significance so please don't give regional anesthesia so how you're gonna give her the general anesthesia pre-medicate modified rapid sequence induction or rapid sequence induction Use ketamine instead of propofol and thiopentone because of hemodynamic compromise and you may use rocronium 
in 1.2 mg per kg dose for a rapid modified rapid sequence induction. Prepare before you start all the tools required for shocked patient. Be smart not to start before your tools are ready, but don't delay the section or the emergency procedure for sophisticated maneuver like a central line. So two big IV lines, level one infuser, invasive monitoring if there is enough time or you have enough hands and blood inside theater. Now, mentioning the murmur, we to discuss a few questions about the murmurs. What are the murmurs on the apex? What are the murmurs heard on the apex? Apical murmurs are mitral and tricuspid valve murmurs. Base of the heart are aortopulmonary valve murmurs. So if you have an aortic valve murmur, this will be on the right upper sternal border. If you have a pulmonary stenosis or regurge murmur, this will be on the left upper sternal border. Tricuspid valve will be the left, left lower sternal border and the only murmurs heard on the apex are the mitral valve murmurs. What's the difference between murmurs and how you are going to categorize them systolic and diastolic? So first and second heart sound, if anything in between, will be a systolic murmur. While diastolic murmur is coming between second and first heart sound of the next beat. So you should know that. How you describe a murmur? Timing. So is it systolic, diastolic? grading from one to six and i got this question in one of my exams before location means apical or basal murmur propagation is it propagating to the axilla propagating to the neck now let's discuss if this lady is coming for an elective section and you know that at one stage she had a painless bleeding or painful bleeding you need to do an echocardiography for her murmur and you need to do bilateral iliac artery balloons at radiology suite before we start cesarean section with balloons up immediately before the uterine incision and deflated after bleeding is controlled. I can refer you to my previous lecture about blood transfusion and anemia and I can recommend to read this very nice and updated review article. Please don't forget to put like and subscribe to the channel just to support my efforts and continuity.